Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a series that aims to provide hope and avenue for healing, and one that will help you understand and then live the great mercy of God. With me today, I have a very special guest from Wichita, Father Lawrence Carney. He was ordained in the Diocese of Wichita in 2007. Uh, in 2014, he was appointed chaplain for the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles, and the foundress, Sister Wilhelmina Lancaster, died in 2019, and in 2022, her body was exhumed and found to be incorrupt. So we're going to talk about Sister and the order uh, for part of the show, and then we're going to get into some of uh, Father's other activities. Uh, but he started the League of St. Martin, an association praying for reverence, reparation and reversion, primarily through joining the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Face and also the Confraternity of the Holy Rosary. So he's been very active and uh, Father, welcome to Mercy Unbound. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here, Brian. Thanks for having me. Father, Sister Wilhelmina, as we mentioned about her order, but for most of her life though, she was in another order, wasn't she? And, and what order was that, and, and why did she feel called to start her own order? Okay, that's good. Good question. So she was in the Oblates of Divine Providence, which was a community started for Black African American Catholics. And she was a little girl in eighth grade that wanted to become a nun. And she wrote a letter to the superior basically saying, I'm this old, I will just bring my suitcase and I will just come and be a nun. And that was like 18, no, it was 1937, uh, give or take a few years. And so she joined them and she was with them, their teaching order for about 50 years, but God was tugging her to get away from a teaching active life and more of a contemplative life so after 50 years she left the community with the idea of founding another one and she in the meantime had been talking to pope john paul ii and other cardinals and priests to help her with this idea but the nuns always tell me when vatican ii and a lot of the real liberal things came in. She just got frustrated and said, I just want to be a nun. I just want to be a nun. So she started the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of the Apostles, about 20 years before she passed from this world. So she had been in religion for 70 years. And what's interesting, a personal note to me and my priesthood, is when I was a seminarian at Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg, Maryland, I really loved um, this professor, Father Roach, and he was teaching all kinds of history courses, and I took every single one of his courses, and we went and visited different places, and since this was close to Baltimore, where the Oblates of Divine Providence were, we actually, I think we visited where they were founded. And he had a whole semester, one class for Black African American Catholics. So it's not coincidence, but it's providence that I was called to be the chaplain of this beautiful Black American Catholic nun for the last six years of her life. And now uh, God is pointing towards her life and, and illustrating that we need to pay attention to what she did and what she's about. So I'll leave it off at that for now and, and see what other questions you have. You know, putting it in that perspective of the time frame of the struggles of the African Americans, but wasn't she a descendant of uh, enslaved Catholics? And that's the glory of Catholicism is she came from a background of being maltreated by human our human family, treated as slaves. Of course, slavery has been around for so many centuries, 
but the kind of slavery that we had in the U.S. was very evil. And so that was the kind that her ancestors were. But the, the great story is that her family overcame that taboo of being a slave and they got over it and they became very much involved in the Catholic faith. And it, it shows you where people can come from, from depravity and rise up to the great heights of sanctity. That's the kind of God that we have. And what's the recipe? One of the most important virtues is humility. That's not the most impressive of virtues charity is, but humility is the gateway to all the other virtues. And that's one virtue that Sister Wilhelmina and her family illustrated to me with the life of Sister Wilhelmina, especially, but in the biography, we, we learn about her mom and dad, how strong Catholics they were, and how they didn't let race get in the way of their happiness. They got close to God and they found that living through different tests and trials helped to make them better Catholics and better Christians and closer in union with God. I'll leave it off on that. Hey, Father, it's interesting you talk about your uh, training there and you took that course on uh, the African-Americans and, and the orders and things. How did you get involved with this then? Did they search you out or did your bishop talk to you or did you search them <laughs> out? Or? I love that story. This story, it's, it's amazing because the story, before I tell you, has a title and that is Abandon Oneself to God's Will. So I have been a priest for roughly five years and I've been a pastor for three of those years and I needed to take a retreat. So I went to Kansas City to see these nuns because they were in the city at the time. And I got to meet the mother there and went back home and then came back again a year later and they had moved into the country. And at the end of my time with them, the mother Abbas approached me and said, Father, we would like you to become our chaplain. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? I really like Wichita. I really like being in my home diocese. I'm about half an hour away from my mom and dad, 30 minute drive. I pass through at a church in Wellington, Kansas. No, the answer is no, I'm not going to do it. Then some things happened after that. They were praying for their chaplain still, and my life completely did a 180. And it was really horrible situation. I just had to get out of what I was doing. So I talked to my bishop and he granted me a leave of absence to discern what it is that God wanted me to do. So I backpacked Europe and spent a long time discerning and came back to those nuns a year after they had asked. And mother, again, she was persistent. She said, Father Carney, will you become our chaplain? And at this time, I was open to the idea and I said, mother, on one condition, if I can live in the city so I can save souls because I've just done the Camino and there's no souls out here. There's just deer and I can't be catching them for souls. So she said, Ida Ad Joseph, go to Joseph, go to St. Joseph. So I ended up becoming their chaplain and I lived in rectories in St. Joseph and walked around the streets in the afternoon praying my rosary, and that's where the whole apostolate, they call it the walking priest. I wish they would call it the missionary priest because it's not just about walking, it's about saving souls. So that's where I ended up, and I've been their chaplain for eight and a half years actively, and I still am their chaplain, and I love being their chaplain. And to be able to be the spiritual confessor of Sister Wilhelmina is just one of the few graces being their chaplain. So I pray that these nuns continue to grow. They are, when I got there, they were 21, 10 years ago, and now they're over 60. Wow. Now, as chaplain, you hear their confessions and you do a periodic mass. Is that 
uh, fair to say, or what? Yeah, what Brian, that's right. So <clears throat> it's pretty simple. I say daily mass for them when I'm acting as their chaplain. And then I hear confessions almost every day. Then I do exposition and adoration for one hour, uh, twice or three times a week. And then other than that, my duties are pretty much done. And there might be some spiritual direction once in a while. It's very rare. There's a few other things I might do. They'll ask me to do. And that gives me the freedom then to do other priestly things. So it's just a great fit for my soul to be their chaplain for 10 years. And who knows what God has in mind, but 10 years is a long time for one place. And in the old days, a pastor would be a pastor for his life. And a chaplain isn't quite as stable as a pastor, but a chaplain could be a chaplain for the, his whole priesthood as well. And so that would be something I wouldn't be adverse to is that stability is something that I know a lot of the nuns have mentioned to me and even recruits that were discerning them that it's so important to have a priest that's a chaplain that's constant so they have a certain father figure that they know his personality they know his quirks they know his goodness and his badness and but they can rely that he's always going to be there and there's something about that that we've lost in our modern church Father, share with us about the spirituality of Sister Wilhelmina. Um, tell us about her as a person. Yeah, she, she, the most, the best quality with Sister Wilhelmina is her childlikeness. And this is a part of spirituality that Jesus Christ really exhorted. He said, unless you become like one of these, and he was holding a little child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Sister Wilhelmina really loved Jesus Christ. And she even called him handsome in a very pure way because he was beautiful, a beautiful human in his nature and a beautiful, beautiful divine person in his, in his divine nature. So she would talk about him quite a bit. And she would have these poems and these stanzas and songs about him. And you just don't see this in the youth today. She had, maybe she even had, had her first fervor. You know, there's this, this thing in the spiritual life about people having their first fervor. So whether it's when they're, young before the age of seven or maybe they come to god at the age of 10 or maybe they convert back to him at 18 but there's that first fervor where one has really getting a relationship with jesus christ and what's important in the spiritual life is that one prays that they keep that first fervor and then it grows and that's something that it seemed like she had i don't know all the details but knowing her soul as I did as her confessor, it seemed like she had that first fervor. And that's what's important for other souls that I'm, you know, that may be able to see this interview is even if we've lost our first fervor, it's important to ask for that back. And then we can really grow in the spiritual life because that first fervor is when God gives us that ability to be like a child and just totally depend on him. And sometimes that first fervor, God gives many consolations. And so a lot of people lose that first fervor because they want the God that's giving them consolations. They want his consolations. But St. John of the Cross says we shouldn't want the consolations of God, but we should want the God of all consolations. So I think she really live that out since a very young age and that's why i think that her greatest quality was her childlikeness her simplic simplicity to being abandoned to the plan that god had and she talks so much about divine providence even i think had a, a poem or a few songs about providence and that is 
to be abandoned to what God wants. God's will. That's, I think, the title of the book, her biography, that the nuns made God's will, God's will, God's will. And that's part of the Our Father. And if we get God's will and we want God's will, we learn about that in the Our Father and we follow that, then we're going to be totally happy in the whatever comes our way because we know it's from the hand of our good God. So she had that. that. You know, it's interesting it's because um, when you were speaking, I was thinking of a page out of St. Faustina's diary where a sister put a big X and says, my will no longer exists, only the will of God. And, uh, you know, that's what we strive for. Turning that all over is an effort, too. Um, you mentioned humility. Uh, that certainly goes against the world today, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Humility is a beautiful thing where I, I just want to at least say a couple things on it. One is, if you can imagine a spiritual edifice, so think of building a little spiritual building. So you have a pillar on one side, a pillar on the other. So that represents faith and hope. And then you have a cupola. So that's like the dome on top of a church. That represents charity. But in order to build this church, you have to have a foundation. You have to excavate the land so you can pour in concrete to have a basement. And that should, should be symbolized as humility. And the more humility you have, the greater spiritual edifice you can build. So there's one thing there. She definitely had that humility. And look, because of her humility, it built this monument called the Benedicts of Mary, Queen of the Apostles, which has 60 nuns now, which chants the divine office in Latin eight times a day, giving God honor and glory. And this is affecting so many people that are oblates and so many people that have come to see Sister Wilhelmina. There were 30,000 people that came during one weekend while her body was still out in the open air. And then the second thing I wanted to mention is in general, humility. We, got, we each need to find a way that we not only ask for humility, but live it out. So for me, it hit me once when I read St. Paul who said, consider everyone else greater than oneself. That's humility. And it's not navel gazing where we always look up into ourselves, but it's making us look out at everyone else. And then St. Thomas, he adds to that, think everyone greater than oneself because of everyone else's hidden virtues and all of my hidden vices. So God hasn't revealed those vices to me nor has he revealed those virtues to me of the other people. And so whenever I start to think about being prideful or to look or compare to someone else, I repeat that. Everyone else is greater than me because of their hidden virtues and, the, and my hidden vices. And Sister Wilhelmina was a great example of that. Now, where's her body at now? And it's outside Wichita, in a small town, right? Yes, in the town of Gower, Missouri. It's about 45 minutes north of Kansas City, and it's also 30 minutes south of St. Joseph, Missouri, and it is in a glass altar. So it's an altar made of wood, but the front of the altar has glass, so you can see her body, and that's where she's laid. So when you walk into the entrance of the church, it's like a cross inside. So when you see the main altar, you're walking in from one side of the arms. You see the altar, and then she is right there, right where the pilgrims can, can come and see her body. Now, just share with us, you know, what does all this mean, uh, an incorrupt body? Walk us through that from the Catholic perspective. Sure. So there's a book called Incorruptibles by Cruz, and it was put out by Tan, and I've had it on my bookshelf for 20 years without ever reading it. It's dusty. So when news came out that Sister Wilhelmina might be incorrupt, I had to read about it. And for one thing, it is extremely rare, and 
another thing is for it to be authentic, the limbs most likely need to be limber. So that's what happened is her limbs are limber. So it's different than a mummy because a mummy has all the embalming and stuff done in Egypt. And it even has a des desert like environment to, where it's dry. So these are kept uh, and preserved. But the problem with, with a mummy is it's like a butterfinger. <laughs> you move the arm, it'll just break. Whereas Sister Wilhelmina is still like she's alive. So that's one of the big differences. And there was even a, a little paragraph in the introduction of grave diggers. They were interviewed and they said, we've never seen anyone in corrupt. But then one guy said, oh yeah, I have. But the problem is when we took him out, he, his finger would break. I mean, so that was, and it, it wasn't even that beautiful. Now, Sister Wilhelmina was buried in a very uh, damp area, and the Missouri uh, ground is, is very wet and clay-like. So this really seems to be something that goes beyond the explanation of science. And so that's why we are going to pray that there's a beautiful process that will examine what we have here and then there will be a declaration whether or not this is truly incorrupt so we await that process and we pray that holy mother church will uh, do its due diligence and this is how these things work has the order begun investigations and putting all those things together over life to present uh, for her process uh, moving along or I haven't heard if they've done that they've done some preliminary things which is they had a biography of her done before they found her body intact then that biography has been uh, given to a publishing company to give it a, a more clear typesetting and to be able to promulgate that in a wider array so those are the little natural steps that are taking and i i have i have not read about how these things usually work because we in the united states of america we don't we're such a young church relatively speaking being maybe 300 years old we're not like in italy where the martyrs you know of the Colosseum are where they have all these relics where there's so many miracles that have happened and there's processes in place that they're used to it. So we're just learning. And so I don't have very many answers, but it will take time and patience is gonna be very important. Father, I wanna change gears a little bit and uh, talk about the um, other activities you're involved with, particularly the Holy Face. Uh, how did you get started in that? Well, how did I get started in the Holy Face? I was writing uh, a newsletter and I was able to have a, a dinner with the nuns on Christmas day. And I asked a nun that I really look up to, Sister Skolaska, I said, Sister, what topic should I write about? She said, oh, Father, the Holy Face. So I said, well, pray for me. And she's a real prayer warrior, just like all of them. I really look up to them and some, providential things began to happen. And I was getting gifts in the mail on this Holy Face devotion. One book was called The Golden Arrow. It was sent to me from someone from another state. And then I got a book called The Holy Man of Tours. And then I got a book called The Whole World Will Love Me within one year. And I had never talked to these people about any devotion to Holy Face because it was just starting for me. And I read these books and my attention was so spiked when I was reading them that I really pulled in a lot of information and I found out that, wow, this devotion has such great potential. And November 11th is my birthday and that's when St. Martin of Tours' feast day is. And he's one of the three patrons of the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Face. So, I'm a numbers guy. I'm a providential guy. It's like things started lining up. It's like these are some 
the priests and bishops that were surrounding this devotion, Sister Mary St. Peter, Venerable Little Pot, they were really producing some very masculine prayers. And it was really, it was, it was balm to my soul, to my heart. It's like, there's this whole system that exists. There's this whole revelations of Jesus Christ that are private, but approved by the local bishop that very few people know about. And, you know, I like the underdog. I like to, to promote the underdog. And this is a devotion that has not had anybody really promoting it for the last century. So it's, I think, I want to start promoting it at a very small level. So I started preaching to the nuns about it. And what's cool is there were four nuns that were getting their names, making their first uh, professions. And all four of them took something that was related to this devotion. So one became Sister Veronica, because this devotion is related to the holy face image of the bell of Veronica. And then one became Sister Mary Petra, which Sister Marie de Saint Pierre is one of the what is the one who received the locutions from Jesus Christ, the intellectual visions. And then another one was Sister Mary Stellas, which is Star of the Sea. And then the last one was Sister Martina. So that's Saint Martin, you know, in a feminine version. So we call these nuns the holy face nuns. So it's really neat. What were some of the messages that uh, Sister Marie de Saint Pierre received? What did the Lord tell her, tell her? Yeah, so that's a very nice question. I can't answer it all as I wished I would, but just to skim the surface, the very number one that's my favorite that I always talk about in a podcast is basically this, Jesus Christ said, my father is greatly disappointed with the human race for the sins of blasphemy and profanation of Sundays and holy days of obligation. And my father is going to not send punishments by the elements, but he's going to send the scourge of revolutionary men. Period. So that was in the 1840s. That was right before the Communist Manifesto came out. And to unpack it in a sentence or two, basically God is punishing us in 2023. And he's punishing us not with typhoons and tornadoes or hurricanes, but with the scourge of revolutionary men. But I think when people get this message, they move way up in the spiritual life very quickly because they stop letting things of this world tie them down. And they say, okay, it's time for me now to get involved and engage in the interior life. And that's what this devotion does, is it helps us to be devoted to the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary. And our Lord said to Sister Mary St. Peter, those two can never be separated. And another a uh, message that Jesus gave to Sister Mary St. Pierre is very beautiful. Jesus talks about the implements of the Passion. He says something like this. I wish that you would take the cross and the instruments of the Passion and hurl them at the enemy. That is the demons and the agents. So the demons, so that they go to the foot of the cross and be judged and be put back into hell. And for their agents who are human beings that they have a complete conversion. So if we can divide the house of this revolution, then it will fall. And that's one of the things Sister Mary St. Pierre received from our Lord when she was receiving this great weapon called the Chaplet of the Holy Face. Because in the chapter, there's an awful prayer that talks about a house divided cannot stand. And this hurling these instruments at the enemy, like the lantern, that the soldiers were carrying around Judas to see the face of Jesus at night. The nails, the spear, the crown of thorns, you know, the crown of thorns, St. Louis is one of the patrons. The crown of thorns that was on the head of Jesus, St. Louis had that in St. Chapelle in Paris. And he was a great defender of the Holy Land of God, leading the Seventh Crusade, and also of the implements, the Passion. So in a, those are just a couple of the messages that Jesus gave to Sister Mary St. Pierre. You know, one of the popes 
actually established the confraternity, didn't they? Yeah, that's what's so important. This is especially a good message for priests, clergy, bishops. Is some say that devotion to the holy face is private. Well, there was a time that it was, and devotion to the Sacred Heart was also private for a while. But then, after a hundred years after it was promulgated, it became this great devotion that the whole Catholic Church understands is not private but public. So. This devotion was made into a confraternity in 1884 by the Archbishop of Tours because Venerable Leo de Pont, who was a great promoter of this devotion to the Holy Faith, he had 6,000 miracles happen in this home. So the bishop, after he passed away, erected this as a private chapel and had priests of the Holy Faith from the chapter of canons that were in the Arch um, Cathedral, they were in charge of this. And so a year went by, and it was almost like a miracle that happened in church politics. The, the uh, cardinal who was in charge of the divine liturgies was very much open to this devotion, and he had a chance to talk to His Holiness, Pope Leo XIII. He presented a petition. There's this confraternity that makes reparation to the Holy Face, Holy Father, and they want to know if they can expand outside of tours to the rest of France. And the Pope paused. And after his pause, he said not only to France, but to the whole world, and he elevated to a arch confraternity. This was unheard of in the courts of the papal chambers. And this was a big boon to this devotion because what it did is it made it official. It made it not private, but it made it public because there's a whole conf arch confraternity that has this whole system and requirements that now is supposed to last in perpetuity. So when priests see, this is what I promote. I don't promote so much the private devotions that can be surrounded around it, but I promote this arch confraternity. So this is an official prayer of the church. An arch confraternity is one degree below a third order of a religious community. It's like third order Carmelites or third order Dominicans. It's just one level below. So it's really high up in canon law. Now, where could one find more information about the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Face? Sure. So there's many sources, but we have a website called the League of St. Martin. So if someone searches that, they'll find our website. And if they go to the, you know, the three dashes, they'll be able to find a place for ecclesiastical enrollments. And there we have little instructions of how people can become members of the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Faith. So we also are have on that website, I'm promoting something here called the, Pil the first pilgrimage of the Holy Face. So we're gonna go to tours, we're gonna go to France and Italy because of Veronica's in Italy. And we're hoping to have some people come so we can really become pilgrims and and you know it's going to cost a little bit of money but this is what pilgrims used to do they used to take two weeks off you know once or twice in their life and they would go on pilgrimage to some devotion that they're really drawn to so we have that on our website too if people want to register for that pilgrimage what's what's that website address father yes it's www.martinians.org. So it's M A R T I N I A N S dot O R G. And it's also the League of St. Martin. So people that are in the League of St. Martin were called Martinians after St. Martin. Now we, we're in a time here of Eucharistic revival. Uh, isn't the, there's a medal of the Holy Face and Eucharist is part of that? Yes, there's a medal of the Holy Face. It has the face of the Shroud of Turin on it. And on the back, it has uh, Mane Vobiscum. So stay with us. And that's when Jesus was walking with some of the disciples on the way to Emmaus. They didn't know it was really Jesus until he broke bread and then they saw his face and they knew it was him and they wanted him to stay that evening so they were kind and hospitable so they got to 
have dinner with Jesus right after his resurrection. So that's a, a huge symbol of the Holy Eucharist. And then another symbol is Jesus Christ in the tabernacles throughout the whole world. He's actually looking at us. When we come into the church, he has a face. It's his Eucharistic face behind the locked doors of the tabernacle, or it's not, it's invisible. Uh, whenever people do Eucharistic adoration, his face is really there in the monstrance. Some people are even seeing little, I mean, I don't really pay attention to a lot of this, but some people are even seeing his face during Eucharistic adoration you know, show up. And this reminds us of a miracle that happened in 1849 where they took the bell of Veronica from St. Peter's Square was up on the second level of the pillar on the uh, pistol side of the papal altar and they took it down and displayed it for three days. And on the third day, um, his face started to shine and artists were drawing what they saw. So his face is, is alive. Oh, wow. Well, Father, I, I want to just thank you so much for joining me today for Mercy Unbound to share with us your insights as chaplain uh, of Sister Wilhelmina Order and her spiritual life, and also the interesting things you've shared with us about the Arch Confraternity and your work there. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts here before we wrap the show up today? Sure. Thanks for asking. So I say this often when I wrap up to the souls. We only have one life to live. And so we need to give God our best. And that's called generosity. And I've talked about two patrons of the Arch Confraternity. That would be St. Martin and St. Louis. But I haven't talked about St. Michael the Archangel. His very name is Reparation. Who was like unto God? And he did reparation when he heard the blasphemy of the demons. And he got the power and the privilege to throw them out. And St. Michael is somebody that's on the front of many people's tongues. We know about him. So we need to become like him and all the other saints in being generous. So right now, go deep into your souls and ask God dearly from heart to heart. Heart speaks to heart. How can I be more generous in my journey? between here and heaven. Hopefully we all get to heaven, but we don't fall into heaven. We actually fall into hell. So we got to remember to follow God's commandments. And I'll leave you with this, that St. Therese of the little child and of the Holy Face, when she was a member of the Arch Comforter of the Holy Face, as a nun, she would pray the Psalms and she would say, literally, the face of God, would jump out at her and the name of God would jump out at every other page. And so she developed a great spiritual life with this devotion to the Holy Face. So I encourage everybody out there to discern and consider becoming members of this great Arch Confraternity, the Holy Face. Father, would you mind, uh, we'll close the show here, but uh, give us all a prayer, those that will, a blessing for those who watch this show or listen to the podcast. Yeah, let me give my priestly blessing. In nomine Patri, et Fili, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Sit nomen Domine Benedictum, et ex hoc nucleusque in seculi. Domine exari orationem meam, et calma mea sate venia. Dominus vobiscum, et cum spiritu tu. Benedictus in potentis Patri, et Fili, Spiritus Sancti, Shindit super, vos et mani et semper, Amen. Amen. Well, people, I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you, Father Carney, for joining us today on Mercy Unbound. Check out their website and uh, let's all work together to be more Christ-like and be an image and reflection of the image of Jesus Christ here in the divine mercy. Thank you again, Father, and uh, we'll hope to have you right. back soon. I would love to come back. Thanks. Thank you. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash drbryan B-R-Y-A-N Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R, and on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference, and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again, 
And for more information, go to the website at drbryanthatcher.com.